like to welcome you to this session, which we have entitled the Academy for New Activist Lawyers. So this session actually grew out of a discussion that I was having with a number of my colleagues concerning the, the prosecution of a young woman in Detroit who is one of my surrogate daughters, actually, by the name of Siwatu Salami Ra. Siwatu is a young uh, environmental and social justice activist, internationally renowned at the very young age of about 27. Um, she's a young mother, and she is also a Muslim. And she was prosecuted for an, uh, an assaultive situation where she was acting in self-defense. But she was unfortunately pro uh, convicted and is now serving a mandatory two years in prison for possession of a firearm. So the discussion came about as it related to the questions that present themselves in the context of handling a, a defense in a high, of a high profile social justice activist who is a black woman, who is a Muslim, who has an unusual name that is likely to be provocative. And we were just bouncing around thoughts and questions and ideas about the challenges that handling such a case, the unique challenges that handling such a case would present, particularly for young attorneys who perhaps haven't thought carefully in advance about the particular things that they need to tease out, for example, in selecting a jury. And so the more we thought about it, the more we realized that this is really something that we should be thinking about in terms of preparing young activist lawyers, young, young lawyers or new, new lawyers who are going to be representing activists and even outside of the context of representing activists, but just as it relates to addressing race matters in the context of a jury trial. So with all of that background in mind, I'm going to ask the panelists, and we'll do this in such a way that anybody who wants to jump in, I would like for you to just jump in and give your remarks. So what does it mean to be an activist lawyer or a movement lawyer or a community lawyer? Well, let me um, uh, at least initiate some discussion around that because I think uh, uh, the National Conference of Black Lawyers, uh, its main mandate and mission is that uh, those of us as lawyers, African lawyers, organizationally with the NCBL, would serve as the legal arm of the movement. And with that, I think there's certain uh, connotations. And uh, not only uh, does it require the activist lawyer, uh, in particular cases as referenced uh, in Sister C. Sawatu's case, but the whole gamut of legal needs of our people is not just confined to um, criminal context, but also various aspects of uh, civil litigation and, uh, and other forms of representation that we believe um, it is essential for a lawyer to, to have a particular mindset and spirit, if you will, as a lawyer. And uh, uh, for me, uh, in terms of trying to uh, address that question of activist lawyer, which whether you 
consider yourself an activist lawyer or not, I think that uh, you, we have to first deal with who we are, you know, uh, as, a, as, as a lawyer. You have to uh, define for yourself what it is that uh, you're doing in the context of the law. And um, there are uh, three references or references to three different great legal um, icons, if you will, that I would submit that we at least as young lawyers, new lawyers, uh, begin to think about ourselves. And the one is um, Brother Charles Hamilton Houston, who was the um, uh, the dean of Howard's Law School back in the 30s, uh, fighting Jim Crow, fighting uh, uh, physical oppression of our people in the South and throughout the country. And as he trained the lawyers at Howard, the law students at Howard, his mandate was that as a lawyer, you are either a social engineer or a parasite on your community. Right. There you go. One. Next, one of uh, NCBL icons uh, that, uh, whose words resonated with me was from Brother Hope R. Stevens, who was a national coach. His mandate was, you as lawyers are those to whose hand will be passed the baton of struggle for the protection and defense of the flickering spark of democracy and the preservation of the hopes for freedom and liberation of our people. And then finally, from uh, one of uh, another NCBL icon, which many of which many of us in the in the room uh, uh, knew, is from Brother uh, Chokwe Lumumba. And he often said, and this wasn't just limited to being a lawyer, but in terms of being a freedom fighter for African people, he would always say that as an individual, you must have an unconditional love for your people. And if not, then you are liable to betray the people. And so I just offer those words from three different legal icons for consideration when young lawyers and new lawyers, law students, begin to process and answer the question as to who you are and uh, what you uh, or how you think you're going to use your law ticket to fight for your people. And so uh, it's another question in terms of the relationship to move to the movement that we will talk about later. But at least initially, I think uh, the words from those three brothers uh, certainly uh, were important to me and I think uh, will be helpful as we uh, ask that question, what is an activist lawyer? I'd like to chime in on that. First of all, you stole my quote. <laughs> I'm mad about that. I was going to quote uh, Charles Hamilton Houston. I could write a poem about that quote, I tell you. Um, I think that I just want to support and, and snap to what my comrade Jeffrey has already said and that we have to really be deliberately and intentionally different from the cookie cutter sampling that's put out and from those who are obedient to the system and those who even give deference to the system. We absolutely have to be radical and revolutionary in our thought process and in our practice. And we have to model courage. Whether we are afraid or not, we have to model courage when we go before the Dred Scott Court and the Dred Scott Judge, 
We have to go with the conviction. I remember when they tried to come after Shokwe's license and Jeffrey and Padua were representing Shokwe in the Dred Scott Court in Mississippi before the Mississippi Supreme Court. And I say Dred Scott Court because that's still unresolved because our people are still excluded from justice. And so I think that taught me, that showed me how you have to navigate from the press conference to the hearings that were held. It was always about not trying to make excuses for what Brother Shokwe did, but making sure that everybody understood that what he did was absolutely necessary and absolutely correct. And we did have some lawyers who were of the Negro persuasion. And I don't want to step on anybody's toes, I don't want to offend anybody, but we had lawyers who got on a conference call with us and said, y'all are wrong, Shokwe was wrong for disrespecting the judge and y'all should not be supporting him. And we had to check them on the call, and we didn't think that we would have to do that. So I think education is key, but I also think just raw courage and convictions are really, conviction is really important, and the skills that are necessary so that we're not ragtag, so that there's no stereotypic assumption that because you're a people's lawyer, you're not skilled. Uh, I learn from the best, and I model that sense of excellence and that sense of care from people who taught me and showed me how to be a revolutionary lawyer that was not going to be ragtag and cliche, but actually was going to have some skills and win some stuff for our people. And when we didn't win, be able to explain that it's not your fault that you didn't win. The system from the auction block to now has always been against you. So it's no wonder, even though we put the proof on, that you didn't get the relief that you deserve. So I just wanted to chime in and show support for uh, what this, this brother, who is one of my mentors, one of my teachers, has shared with us today. So one of the important takeaways that I'm getting from your remarks, Reba, is the importance of not depriving the activist, in this case, Shokwe was our brother, and he's an attorney, but he was, you know, he's an activist, not depriving them of their voice and of their agency. It's not our decision how they choose to act and how they choose to assert themselves. And it's our job and our responsibility to protect them. That's right. And to, as I say, to, 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 to raise their voice. Yes. Does anybody else want to comment on that point? Um, so how does this, <coughs> So we've talked about sort of the overarching themes, but how does it show up specifically in the practice, in the courtroom? And, you know, I guess specifically how in your practice do you encounter issues involving race, involving social activism, and how do you, what specific advice do you have to young lawyers about addressing those matters. Well, let me, uh, let me chime in again. Um, because I, I think that um, there oftentimes is a sort of like a romantic uh, perception of lawyers on TV and they have these causes and uh, and you have these sound bites that you think are just out, out are, are great but it is a very uh, serious relationship that needs to uh, be uh, developed between the lawyer and the client who, uh, whether it's for a social uh, issue like uh, 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 demonstrators with Black Lives Matter, um, whether uh, you have a client who has been criminalized uh, and you're dealing with uh, defending them, um, and uh, and, and so off, or, or be involved in so-called social or movement kind of cases. 
um, that being the voice of the movement of that particular uh, issue uh, is it isn't always an easy task mm -hmm. because you have, you, although uh, you don't, you're not, we as, as African lawyers, we're not separate from the movement. You know, we are a reflection of the movement, we're part of it, but our role is different from the movement because we are like the buffer between the movement and the oppressive system that is, is, is on our clients. Um, um, and, and Brother John, uh, when I was uh, coming into law school, some of you may not know, but John Britton was part of the legal team representing the RNA 11 mm -hmm. when the Mississippi uh, uh, state law enforcement apparatus, the FBI, and who knows what other government agencies attacked the leadership and the citizens of the Republic of New Africa in uh, Jackson, Mississippi in an effort to kill them. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and Brother John was part of the uh, a legal team of several lawyers in representing the RNA 11 in that context, of, in context, and perhaps he may comment on that somewhat. But um, being the voice of the movement or your client requires some real serious conversations and discussions with them so that you can adequately reflect their voice in the context of the courtroom. It's, when I say it's not always easy because there's maybe contradictions. The movement, the folks may have a particular perspective in terms of what they want to project from a political and social perspective that may or may not be consistent with the legal challenges and dynamics that have to be pursued in the court. And so there has to be uh, uh, certainly a lot of discussion around how those social and political I issues interface with the legal issues that you have to deal with in the courtroom. You know, and that uh, 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 the movement folks understand really the, the legal consequences of decisions that are being made in terms of how they want the issues to be projected. And so um, uh, it's, it's, it's a very complicated issue. Oftentimes, egos, whether it is uh, egos from uh, the political and social perspective or the lawyer's egos that get involved and get in the way of really pursuing and projecting the type of voice that, uh, that is necessary in dealing with the social, political, and legal issues that give rise out of any particular, whether it's Black Lives Matter, the uh, uh, Panther 21, RNA 11, whatever it might be, that those discussions have to be made. I think I was baptized, more or less, as a activist lawyer. The year was 1971. I was only two years out of law school. The place was Jackson, uh, Mississippi. The incident that uh, Jeff just mentioned is that a group of African Americans called the Republic of New Africa yes. came to uh, Jackson, Mississippi and declared free the land. And in declaring uh, free the land, they claimed that African Americans, former slaves, had the right of the Kush district. And the Kush district was basically the uh, sole states of the Deep South. And they had a theory uh, based upon a Cherokee Indian Supreme Court precedent 
that when the former slaves, Africans, were freed from slavery in the United States, they had on the international law three choices. One choice was to return to their native homeland continent of Africa at the United States expense since it kidnapped them against their will for some violence mm -hmm. and brought them to the United States. The second choice was to become a part of the Republic. And that the United States did without asking them and adopting the 14th Amendment that made all persons naturalized in the United States their citizens. But there was a third. And the third came out of the uh, Cherokee Indian tribe and that was to offer them land in the then settlements throughout the United States, which were open and free uh, to start their own uh, nation. And they claimed the third, and they claimed the violation of international law is that they were never given a plebiscite to decide which of those three options to choose. Rather, the United States chose that citizenship option for them. There was a raid early one morning in August by every law enforcement agency, federal and state. And there were women and children and adult men in the home. The uh, home was a residence on Lynn Street in Jackson, Mississippi, near Jackson State University. It was an early dawn raid. The police had a, a fraudulent basis that there was a known fugitive, fugitive in the house. Uh, but that wasn't true. And they raided it early in the morning by throwing tear gas first and then bombarding the home with every kind of weapon and every kind of bullet you can imagine. The uh, residents had burrowed the basement or the crawl space of the home, which is dirt, deep enough so that through a door or really just an open hole cut through the wood on the floor of the building, <coughs> They could crawl down into this space with only about five inches between the ground and the lower part of the house to look out. And that berm of ground saved them from all that fuselage of shooting, and no one was killed. They were early in the morning. They were playing clothes. There's no warning. Shot the tear gas in. People thought they were being attacked by the Ku Klux Klan or the white supremacists. And they had arms, which were legal. And they defended themselves. And one police officer was shot and killed. Chokwe Muma came down, where I was a lawyer for the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights on the Law, on Faber Street, which was the Black Harlem of Jackson at the time, and asked if I would represent the nation. He went on to tell me what the nation was, and I asked him, well, what is your office in the nation. And he said he was the Minister of Justice. <laughs> and I said, well, where do you practice? He says, I don't practice. I'm a law school student right here where we're sitting in Wayne State University School of Law. And I've taken leave from law school in order to come defend my wow. nation down here. Wow. And we wish to retain you to represent us. I said, well, your nation has very modern progressive rules on who can be the minister of justice <laughs> and not be a lawyer. <laughs> and for the next four or five years, my life was dedicated to defending the nation and to adopting their views on independence and to trying them in the courts for their sovereignty and trying them against any death penalty. Fred Branks was one of the lawyers with us. Um, another lawyer from uh, New Orleans was uh, a third one on the team. And we took up the movement for our clients. <coughs> that was my baptism in being an advocate <coughs> lawyer, uh, listening to my clients, articulating in what was known as a political defense. So we waged a political defense that they had the same right that um, Singh Bay had in the Amistad case. Mm -hmm. And the Amistad case was a 1830s Supreme Court case of those Africans who were kidnapped 
brought to the shore in uh, Connecticut when the uh, Cuban captain tricked them and when they committed mutiny on the high sea. And they overtook the captain and they killed him. And the uh, second in command, instead of sailing back to Africa, sailed towards the uh, United States. And those uh, slaves, uh, with a uh, political and legal and international defense, were uh, freed. And they were freed on the grounds that uh, international slavery was illegal. And the uh, slave runners had no right to capture them and head for the United States. The Supreme Court lamented that the mutiny and the murder were committed on high sea. But it's the only case in which it held that self-defense from slavery justified any form of murder. Mm -hmm. And they were free. They were released in Connecticut. They spent some time. Some religious groups helped send them back. And that was one of the defenses that the nation said they had to be free. And so that's one little story of my life, two years out of law school, and becoming an activist lawyer on behalf of the Republic of New Africa. Their home base, by the way, was right here in Detroit, too. Absolutely. Free the land. Free the land, Free the land. Free the land. Mm -hmm. What was the outcome of the case? Uh, the outcome of the case is that three of the people were convicted of murder, but we spared them the death penalty. In one particular case of uh, Akima, the state trials ended. The federal government charged Omari Obadelli, mm -hmm. who was the president, with a conspiracy for the homicides that took place at this other house. Obadelli and half a dozen other Africans were not linked to the events in the house except they were members of the same nation. When the state trials ended, the state released those persons convicted to federal custody, thinking they would be tried in federal court and they would be sentenced for the rest of their life in federal court. The federal cases were reduced to very minimal charges. And when they were sentenced to less than 10 years, the state became furious. And they tried to recapture those convicted prisoners that they had released. But because they released them to the federal custody without any restrictions and without any right of return, the courts held that they couldn't return those prisoners. In the end, all persons involved in the RNA 11 escaped the death penalty, and all were freed within 10 years. Woo! We're talking about yes. Um, since we're telling war stories about how we got baptized, I want to share my baptism in the state of Mississippi, goddamn. You said Nina, Nina Simone? Nina. For the song, and Nina, Nina and the reality the song. of the song. Uh, I, as a young lawyer, not chronologically, because I went to law school when I was 42 years old. I, it was my fourth career. I'd been a high school English teacher and a union organizer and always a culture artist in the movement. I was baptized in law on a Klan case out of Pelion, South Carolina. The case involved uh, a club called the Illusions. And the club was frequented by African Americans because guess what, that was who was predominantly located in this particular part of South Carolina and in most parts of South Carolina for that matter. And there were Klansmen, uh, Horace King and others, who decided that this nigga nightclub needed to be shut down and they took young Klansmen, young, shiny-faced, a 17-year-old and a 21-year-old, and they mentored them into actually carrying out the criminal act. They stepped back 
and were not prosecuted while this teenager and a 21 year old were prosecuted for shooting up the nightclub, putting holes in people's bodies. Nobody died fortunately, but people were shot up and some people ducked under cars and were scraped up pretty bad from hiding underneath the cars, scraped up on the concrete, uh, suffered from bruises and some severe head traumas as well. Well, we, I was working with the Center for Constitutional Rights at that time, Judge McCray, Margaret Carey McCray, had just went on the bench and I became the director of uh, the Center for Constitutional Rights South. And that was my first case, my first actual litigation case. We had done some other things, but that was the first case where I was actually taking over a case that had already been developed and we were on our way to court to represent people who had been shot at and shot up by the Klan. The reason why the case is so significant is because it ended in a settlement and was a very, very, very small settlement because both of these young men were, of course, judgment proof. But the most important thing about that case that stands as precedent today is that it is the only case where there was a permanent judgment enrolled against the Christian Knights of the KKK. Hmm. And in that judgment, the language says hmm. if the Christian Knights of the KKK does anything toward an African American or a black, they could suffer criminal incarceration, criminal fines, and all manner of punishment if they in any way attack black people. And that was in the order. That was in the language of the order, and it's permanently enrolled. And so in 2000, the 21st century, the first of the 21st century, that was a judgment that was enrolled while I, when I became a people's lawyer at the Center for Constitutional Rights. And those brothers and sisters did get justice as a result of CCR's philosophy of marrying of activism with lawyering. Come on, y'all, show some love. <laughs> I just want to add a quick footnote to what she said about the uh, Center for Constitutional Rights in New York, CCR. It was led by three very brilliant activist lawyers. One was Bill Kunstler, a real radical lawyer, represented Bobby Seale and many of the... Fannie Lou Hamer. Fannie Lou Hamer, many of the uh, Black Panthers. Another one was Arthur Canoy. Who was my personal mentor? He wrote this uh, significant book called Rights on Trial. And the picture has him being led out of the United yes. States That's right, by Congress <laughs> from the hearings on what was known as the Un American Committee, right. part of the red baiting in the uh, light. That's right. Marshals had their arm around his neck. He was only about five feet and 110 pounds, and they were dragging him out. He was also a professor at Rutgers University, and the uh, unknown most of the triplet was uh, Morty Stavis, who was the real tactician and the uh, brains of legal theory in that well-known progressive law firm legal organization at that time. And in the South, it was Judge Margaret Carey McRae who was the first director right. when she was a civil rights lawyer before she went on the bench. Correct. So they had two offices at that time. Well, later on. Okay. Um, Brandy and Walter. Y'all be quiet. <laughs> um, I want to try to bring it back to nuts and bolts. Okay? What do you do in contemplation? of addressing these kinds of issues in prominent social justice, in, you know, in way of rep representing prominent social justice activists, or regular run-of-the-mill black folks, okay? What kinds of, what, in what ways do you try to address the question of race? So, um, my practice is a little different, and I, I was born in 1977, so I, I, I came on the scene as some of these issues were um, really morphing. I mean, racism is persistent. It is a dogged opponent that knows how to change form and become more subtle and yet remain effective nonetheless. Mm. Um, 
And so in my practice in federal court, the struggle is a little bit different. I don't get to choose my clients, so I don't have a large base of activist clients. What I do have is brothers and sisters living an everyday life who are confronting racism and oppression in their regular lives. And that racism and oppression shows up at literally every phase of the criminal justice process. When you're talking about these so-called consensual encounters between police and our citizens, right? Uh, where I've seen cases where police have come across four lanes of traffic on the wrong side of the street to have a consensual talk with two brothers who are just walking down the way minding their business. Um, we've all heard about the stop and frisk issues that exist in the state of New York and elsewhere, right? Uh, right here in our own uh, city where police are making decisions based on race about who gets stopped and why they get stopped. When, it's, uh, when it comes down to a decision on who to arrest and whether to arrest them, you, for marijuana uh, related cases for instance, you find that blacks and whites have the same level of use, but black folks are more likely to be arrested for that use than our white users. When you talk about the charging decision itself, what crime gets charged? Uh, what gets said about justifying the charges? Are there any mandatory penalties that are going to get applied? And who gets to receive those charges versus those who don't? Um, when you come into court and you're talking about the bond determination, some of the techniques that the prosecutors use to present their case are steeped in racial undertones. Uh, you, you, we've seen prosecutors and the brothers who practice in federal court with me can attest to this, where you come in and you've got some elaborate PowerPoint presentation where you've got a, a prosecutor who is not a person of color who is purporting to interpret black English vernacular or slang. But let me tell you what he meant when he said this. And, I mean, last time I checked, my people didn't have the same sort of access to the Second Amendment as many others. But, uh, you know, they're, 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 they're flashing these pictures of brothers holding guns. And, I mean, listen, the, the Internet is replete with images of white children who hold guns and, and their, their families and their loved ones and nobody demonizes them for it, right? And so there's all these, these subtleties that aren't so subtle, but they're present. And if, if you don't uh, find that power, if you don't marshal your own internal courage to be fearless in the response, in, in, in the face of all this stuff, and to start to create a response, you know, it'll go unchecked and they'll continue to do it. It shows up in, uh, in simple things, like in, in acquisition of expert services, right? I mean, I've had polygraph examiners who say things that make it crystal clear that they've got some predetermined judgments about mm -hmm. black people and our truthfulness. I've had psychologists where I've had to go back and say, now listen, why did you include this language in the report? Mm -hmm. Because all it does is reinforce a stereotype of that person and it's mm -hmm. not essential to your conclusion. Um, it shows up in plea negotiations, it shows up in jury selection, it shows up in sentencing. I mean, at every juncture. So I can't agree more that just from a, a broad perspective, one of the first things you have to do, well, I, I back up and, and say this, you have to affiliate yourself with like-minded people, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. You have to find a space mm -hmm. to be around and be with other lawyers who <coughs> speak with the same voice as you because it is overwhelming. It can be, uh, it can feel like a, a, a tremendous uphill battle. And so you do have to, um, you have to be fearless. You have to be sensitive to what our people mm -hmm. are saying. And as Jeff said, you have to work as hard as you can to listen to them and then put their stories out there first. I'm going to give you a concrete example. Um, so I didn't pass this out as a handout, and I brought this up in another presentation, but I thought it was powerful, so I'm going to repeat it here. So I had a case that got charged where a young sister, a young mother actually, um, was with a, a girlfriend of hers, and they were out on the street, and they, this is, this is an exceedingly minor offense, but to tell you how the federal government uh, will escalate something and blow it all out of proportion and destroy a person's life in the process. But this sister and her girlfriend and another friend of theirs were out on the street in uh, early spring in Detroit, and they were just sort of minding their business. And up walks a postal carrier, and the postal carrier is on her phone. She's not being particularly um, professional and courteous, and she misdelivers a piece of mail. And the clients are trying to tell her, "Listen, that's not that's not our address." Well, it turns into a situation. She's disrespectful to them. They've got some challenges themselves in terms of how they interact with the world. And so it, it escalates into a situation that, it, that never should have happened. I mean, windows on the mail truck get broken. The woman gets sort of, uh, you know, run out of the place. But look, she makes it into her mail truck. She doesn't get hurt. Nobody lays a finger. There's not a, an ounce of blood spill. I get a complaint um, from the prosecutor that, uh, that lays out the basis for what they believe is an eight-year felony for assault. 
on a federal employee. Mm -hmm. And in the in the in the in the complaint that the affidavit that the officer swore out um, in support of these charges, he had this to say about the description of the sisters. The special agent or the, the, the postal employee described her assailants as follows. One light-skinned African-American male in his late 30s or early 40s with a small beard, mustache, and fade haircut. Not so bad. But when you get to the sisters, this is what they say. One, quote, very dark-skinned African-American female in her late 20s with her hair in a ponytail, red shorts, wide nose, bad skin. Ooh, bad skin. What the heck is that? Mama. One, one light-skinned African-American female with short hair and a pigtail, a white t-shirt and yoga pants, approximately 5'4 or 5'5. Five five. Now, not everybody is going to read that and take exception to it, right? But I did because I met these sisters, and I think based on this description, everybody who interacts with this case is going to come with a set of preconceived notions. You out here with your wide nose and your bad skin acting a fool, bothering these good people who are just trying to do their job. And so from the very beginning of this case, I had to work to deconstruct the myth of this stereotype. And as I said, it shows up at, at literally every stage. So when I'm sitting down with the prosecutor, who I have to say, it took some work to make them understand that this was not appropriately charged as an eight-year felony for either one of these women. Mm -hmm. They were not convinced of this. And I had to say, and I mean, so we, what we do, one of the specific things we do is write mitigation letters to the prosecutor to say, can you please revisit your charging decision? And so I had to write up a very lengthy letter to say, listen, one thing that this, I, I can tell you that these sisters got some mental health issues. I can tell you, you know, about this circumstance and why you shouldn't have taken it all out of control. But I also need to say she's not a living, breathing stereotype. She is a mother. She, uh, she is somebody who is doing the best she can under the circumstances she lives in to interact with the world in a healthy and productive way, right? And so, I mean, listen, it was a minor thing, but it, it wasn't so minor, frankly, because if I, I feel like if I hadn't said it, if I hadn't named it, and my prosecutor was a sister, right? But if I hadn't Ooh. said it and named it and set it on the table like that, I think everybody around that table would have continued to look at them that way and, and, and be less lenient. Um, it took some persuading, but I was able to get them to bring it down to a misdemeanor, but even, as I said, in position of experts. I had an expert who wrote up a report after interviewing her, and we all know, we talk with the habitual bee. I think it is, I think we have a brilliant way of speaking to each other that is coded and that only we understand. But folks outside of our community don't understand that and they don't appreciate it. And with these kind of stereotypes in place, if you include that in a report and it's not necessary to the conclusion, then you've sort of compounded the problem. So I've had, I had to check the expert. And then when we get to sentencing, I had to start checking the judge about some of the conditions he was trying to impose. So it, in my opinion, a big part of this is being very in tune with your clients, getting a deep social history, talking, talking to them. And one thing, that I, one thing that I say to all of my clients is, listen, I'm going to ask you a lot of questions. They are going to feel invasive. They're going to feel like I'm getting into your business. But I have to do that because... You don't have a voice through 90% of the process. Mm -hmm. right? Every time I stand up, I've got to speak for you. You can't tell your own story. I have to tell it for you. And so if I don't know you, if I haven't taken the time to connect with you and to feel your spirit and understand where you're coming from and how you tick, I can't convey that story as effectively sure. to the judge. And as they said, you can't do that if you don't have a basic love and respect for the people that you're working with, right? So. For me, it shows up in the smallest ways that then have to be woven together to confront the bigger challenges that are down the line. I have some other examples um, that I've circulated that we'll talk about later. But mm -hmm. I think whether you are representing someone in one of these uh, high profile cases where the newspapers are going to be there, or in a case that uh, Brandy, uh, the type of case that Brandy had where someone may be charged with the so-called routine type of an offense, the best thing you can do, and I think the first thing you want to make sure of, is that your client has a good lawyer. <laughs> You want to be a good lawyer. Your, whether your client has money or not, you want to be a good lawyer. To me, that means 
understanding the context in which you're operating. Mm -hmm. The full context, but specifically if you're talking about litigation, what is the nature of the system and what are the rules that apply? So, and how do you take those rules to their furthest logical extent? So, for example, if one of the rules is that you are presumed innocent mm -hmm. until they say, but I argue to juries that it really should be unless, not right. until, but right. until presumes that at some point you will be convicted. Mm -hmm. So I tell them, even though the judge is going to instruct you that presumed innocent until uh, proved guilty, really you think about it in terms of unless. Mm -hmm. And then also, you're not really talking about innocent. You're not going to see innocence on a, on a jury mm -hmm. form, on a verdict form. You're talking about not guilty or guilty. And again, back to what I was about to say, if you're talking about the presumption of innocence, then your verdict form would have not guilty first. That's right. Not guilty. Yes. And that's a fairly new uh, <laughs> invention mm -hmm. in state law anyway. When I started practicing, the verdict form said guilty. And you would hear lawyers say, defense lawyers, guilty or not guilty. No. You know, you you want to keep the word guilty out of your mouth mm -hmm. as mm -hmm. much as possible. Mm -hmm. you know, yeah, you, you want to try to keep that out of your mouth as much as possible. So um, your job also is to bend the rules. You know the rules, mm -hmm. but you bend them as far as you can. Sometimes you may even break them mm -hmm. if it's not going to blow back on your client mm -hmm. because you... It's not about you. You're not going to jail, you know, unless you in contempt <laughs> or, right. <laughs> or something like that. Exactly. But and and your criminal record is not at stake. Your freedom is not at stake. So it's not about you. You're there to return that client's uh, status to not charged if you can or to preserve their status of being not guilty, mm -hmm. if you can. And everything you do is directed toward that goal. So there are no superfluous actions. There are no needless questions. There are no pointless activities. You know, if you don't know what you're asking this witness for, if why you're asking them, Stay in your seat. That's right. Mm -hmm. You don't have to get up and give an opening statement just because the other side did. You know, know what you're doing. Whether you represent Chokwe, whether you represent the sister that Brandon's talking about, whoever it is, know what you're doing. Also, um, if you are dealing with a jury from the heart, that's a very different experience than dealing with them from the head. So that requires, though, that you do some work yourself, mm -hmm. on yourself, because mm -hmm. you need to know who you are mm -hmm. before you can deal with someone from here. You need to be working on this. So that's, that's important also. I start my uh, representation clients with a book. I have business cards, but in lieu of a business card, I give them a book called As a Man Thinketh or As a Woman Thinketh because I want them to understand that even though they're in this context, in an oppressive context, and that we're dealing with the continuing effects of past discrimination, mm -hmm. in, in very real ways, we're dealing with it's brand new, related to the rest of the speakers. Racism, discrimination, we're dealing with that every day. Mm -hmm. But you're in here. You know, you're in here. It's not what happens, it's what you make happen next. You, can, you know, we can focus on the system and the surroundings and the context, but where is your power? You know, what decisions are you making? What decisions will you make? 
So I give them a book, uh, As a Man Thinketh, that talks about the, the connection between thought and purpose, thought and character, thinking and health and the body, purpose. You know, because if you don't know what you're here to do, you you better get caught up in some stuff. It's easy to do, because you're not on purpose. But if you're on purpose, you can hear stuff when it ain't sounding right. You, you know, if you're thinking about action, circumstances, thought, and you know what's going to happen as a result, you're better able to make a decision that may keep you out of court in the first place. Now, if you, if, but if you do wind up there, they need a good lawyer. So, uh, and we were talking, as uh, Desiree said, this, uh, the origin of this uh, workshop was a discussion that we had about the case where she mentioned Siwatu. And I want to say right off the bat, we're not judging anyone's decision or their skills. It's just provided a departure point uh, for this discussion. But the important thing that uh, we kind of focused on was the prosecutor had told, apparently, if I'm wrong, correct me, the prosecutor had told uh, Siwatu's lawyers that if she held the preliminary examination, in other words, if she uh, wanted witnesses to come forward and for the court to determine whether there was enough evidence for the case to go to trial, they were going to add a charge of felony firearm. In other words, the possession of a firearm during the commission of the underlying felonious assault charge, the assault of scrape that she, that she got involved in. Now, you know, when we heard that, we thought, well, what was she doing holding the preliminary exam? And recognize that it's the felony firearm that carries the mandatory two-year penalty that she's serving. The equities in her case were mm -hmm. such that the judge did not give her any time at all on the assault, even mm -hmm. though the jury convicted her of it. Mm -hmm. But the judge had no choice about giving her that two years for that felony mm -hmm. firearm that didn't get added until they chose to do the preliminary examination. Right. Mm -hmm. And I understand that, um, I could be wrong about this, but because of the nature of the case, and perhaps because of her activism, she thought that she was giving something up, or uh, the, uh, the complainant, had, and that, that's nothing I want to stop right here. Victims, do not. the jury decides who's a victim. If, you know, even then, I mean, in this day and age, nobody wants to be a victim, I think. That, that's, that's really a powerless position to be in. So, but you certainly don't want the prosecutor and you to be referring to the complainant as a victim. You know, there are a lot of subtle psychological things that happen at a trial. Uh, Brandy touched on those a, a, a little bit. But there's a lot of stuff that happens at a trial very subtle kinds of drip, drip, drip things. If you're not alert to them, by the time you stand to argue close, in closing argument, the, you know, the, the fate is sealed. Mm -hmm. So you, get, you, you have to be careful about those things. So my thinking was, waive the preliminary examination. You may have differences of opinion, or there may be different statements that the complainant has made at different times, or whatever. Thresh all that out at trial when you're looking at just the felonious assault where when your client has no prior record and all this other stuff going for her, the likelihood is she's going to be able to get probation and five years after that's all over, if she's not successful on appeal, you can move to expunge the record. But if you're talking about two-year mandatory minimum that you get convicted of, and she had, was she pregnant that she time? She was whatever? pregnant and she was forced to give birth in prison. And yes. so the nursing, she, you can't nurse your baby in prison if that was her choice. It's like there's so much at stake here, you can't, you know, that to me would be the type of case where 
if the client says, no, I'm going to call this clear examination, I think I would say, you need another lawyer. I'm not going to, I'm not going to litigate this for you. I can't sit here beside you and stand here with you while you make this kind of decision. It's you know, too risky. You know, one thing that comes to mind uh, as you talk about that, Walter, is uh, that also is, is a is a salient issue when you're talking about representing activists. Siwatu was and continues to be surrounded by this whole plethora of activists and media people and, and, and just rabble rousers of all you know from all walks of life who were all in her head mm. all the time about what you know what sh what choices should be made in terms of trying to protect her and, and, and defend her. Well, they sit home. Yeah, <laughs> and it undermined, no. it undermined the rapport mm -hmm. between the attorney mm -hmm. and, 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 and her to the extent that she made choices that were definitely against her best interests mm -hmm. and that she's going to have to suffer for. Yeah. It, it's know, some it's some question. I have a question about that because I, I, I come in on that in two different ways. Um, are you saying that the people that surrounded her were part of a village of support? They loved and as a result, it. they stated their opinions about how the case was going? Or what? Because I'm not, I'm not sure I agree that them being in, their head, in her head was a bad thing, necessarily. No. So maybe I'm misunderstanding what you what you're putting forward. Yeah. Any I, I, them, can I get her to answer that for you? And that well, question was to her. I mean, maybe yeah. there's a maybe you want to say something cautionary. Okay. I don't know. Was that something cautionary? That's see. That's see. Let me let me okay. stop. Let me stop. Okay. Now I directed my question. I'm not trying to put you on the spot, but uh -huh. the reason I directed it to you is because you laid out a particular frame. Yeah. And okay. I would like for you to it? explain. What the circumstances oh, yeah. were that drew you to the conclusion oh, yeah. that you? I, I just wanted to be sure that he wasn't trying to say something. Okay. Maybe I wasn't thinking okay. about it ethically or whatever. No you know, um, they, you know, the activists had an agenda, and they saw themselves as we know how to get things done, and the way you get things done is by raising hell and you know, making a lot of noise. Just as an example, this particular judge was very new to the bench and was very timid and was not going to do anything that he thought would, you know, bring, bring some unnecessary attention to himself. So we wanted, and I became involved after she was convicted. I was brought on to lead the appeal. Um, and quite frankly, I feel that, the, 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 that this energy that went on with the activists destroyed my relationship with her in terms of, of handling that appeal. So, for example, when we presented the motion for bond to the judge, we wanted to keep it quiet and low key because we knew that judge didn't have the courage to step out in front of a whole bunch of people, you know. But, as I say, they were all in her head and they had her thinking that it was going to be important. Like, as if their activism could make a difference in the, in the outcome of the decision, which it did not. And in fact, I think that when he was put in the limelight, he dug his heels in. You know, that's just one example. So, so it really depends on it's example by example because when we did the hate violence case against the largest employer in the state of Mississippi and we packed the courtroom every day against a company that was allowing white boys to make nooses and we had represented two people who suffered from attempted lynchings. These were civil matters but criminal offenses. And someone said to us, well, you know, you're packing that courtroom, that might make the judge mad. If you're packing the courtroom, that might make the judge uneasy because he sees all of these folks. And you've got the press conference outside and you've got the picket line outside against hate violence in the workplace, against terror on the plant floor, really was our campaign. So in that particular situation, we had already steeled 
our clients in the fact that the only way you're going to get justice is to have maximum exposure because we're in Mississippi and it is the law to oppress you in these workplaces. That mm -hmm. is not illegal. So we had to have the help of the public to make a public record and a public pronouncement about what was going on inside the courtroom. Yes. So that was happening outside and we believe that the reason why our folks got the justice that they did and we won zero tolerance in that workplace, making it an offense where you could be terminated if you write racist graffiti or if you're caught making a noose. For the first time ever in the state of Mississippi, we were able to give zero tolerance in that workplace. And we think in part, if not all the way, it was because of the activist piece that was running alongside it. So I'm just, I'm just wanting to say that, that there's, a, there's a balance there in terms of sometimes you're going to need that and sometimes but when the horse is already out of the barn, it's not a lot you can do right. about. Right. You can't pull people back in. You can't reel them back in and say, look, be quiet once it's already out there. That's real tough to do. Well, I think yeah, that's one thing to say. Oh, that. Yeah. Oh, uh, 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 yeah, go ahead, Jeff, because you were first, and then Brandy wanted to speak, and then, yeah. and then Walter. I, I think this, this uh, gives rise to uh, a very important um, dynamic in terms of the relationship between the legal apparatus and the social movement. And uh, because uh, uh, oftentimes the political and social analysis may not necessarily be uh, consistent and compatible with the, the legal effort that has to be put forth. But there has to be a dis thorough discussion and an and honest uh, analysis of those dynamics because ultimately although there's the uh, the social and political support for an individual at least in the criminal context uh, that the, 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 the specific client has to deal with the consequences of the process and so yes it is important in many instances that you galvanize the community around uh, a particular issue. You want the, their presence in the courtroom. You want the, the prosecutor and the judges to know that this person is not isolated, that uh, there's a righteous cause that uh, has resulted in the criminalization of this behavior, or, or even if it's just a straightforward criminal uh, uh, case. But uh, a lot of times, the political and social support does not always understand the, uh, uh, the, the, the legal apparatus. And so you have to, you have to spend time. We're going to be going around on this one, but I don't think we should take up off of that. No, but I, what I I'm saying you, is that's an issue saying. that has to be developed. Mm -hmm. You know, you can't ignore that, you know, because I've, and you talked about this sister getting a, a two years that could have been avoided, notwithstanding the social and political perspective. I've been in cases where, uh, and, and Gerald up in, in Grand Rapids, uh, uh, when we were up there uh, defending people around police brutality, where brothers were offered the youth. 17 and 16, uh, 17 year old were offered misdemeanors, but because of the social and political uh, uh, family and community pressing them, oh, you can't negotiate this, the right. brothers end up getting close to life in prison. Right. Yeah. You know, simply because of the, the, the and, and so it wasn't fully vetted, is all I'm saying, in that instance. And that yeah, well, we can't let them make the people escape the scapegoat for their retaliation and their vindictiveness no, and, I'm their, not, and the mean-spirited justice system. No, I'm not, not making blame that, the people. I'm not making them the scapegoat. I'm just pointing out the reality of the relationship and some of the contradictions that arise in a very real and, 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 and practical 
Brandy, Brandy, what you want to so say? I just, I, I think the, the takeaway, at least as I see it, is a point that I was going to make anyway, which is that you really do have to individuate your approach to whatever circumstance you're dealing with. You have to know your form. I, I remember one of the one of the older lawyers um, that works in my office said to me one time, "Look, we represent clients, not causes," and that kind of bothered me because I went, "Yeah, you can't lose sight of the cause, though." in an individual case, but the truth of the matter is that you cannot sacrifice a client for the sake of the cause, particularly if the client is not on board with that approach, right? So it really does depend on your audience. And so in some instances, and I've heard, uh, I've heard lawyers say, look, and there's some judges over in that courthouse where if you say things about race explicitly, it is going to backfire because they are not sympathetic. And so what you have to do instead is maybe pull up your social science research. And so there's a lot of resources available through the United States Sentencing Commission. There's a, a host of literature on racial disparities in the charging process and so on and so forth. And so one of the cases that I, the thicker material that I handed out to you is an example. It's not from my office, but there's a sister in New York who, um, you know, look, the mass incarceration and collateral consequences of felonies and all of that is something that disproportionately burdens our people. And she could have walked in the courtroom and said, listen, judge, my, my woman, my, my, uh, my client is a black woman who's going to face all of this, you know, collateral stuff if you, um, if you give her a sentence that, you know, that reflects, uh, that locks her up for a long time and takes her out of the community. Instead of taking that direct approach, which she thought wouldn't be appropriate with the forum that she was in front of, she did a very, very comprehensive analysis of all the uh, different collateral consequences that can accrue, and she persuaded that judge and got that judge to be on board as an advocate. And that judge issued a very lengthy and useful opinion, which details in probably 40, 50 pages all the ways that these convictions saddle our people for a long time and take them out of the workforce and, and really have the impact of branding them. So in a nutshell, what she, she took the Michelle Alexander narrative convinced the judge through an indirect approach to adopt it, and then that judge has now issued opinion which can be cited over and over again, right? So there are multiple ways of achieving the same goal. The other thing that I, uh, that I presented to you is an example of a letter that I did in a case where the government had the nerve to be pissed at my client for uh, participating in a, a community program they had sponsored about ceasefire, and then the next day going and engaging in a drug deal. And I thought it was the most absurd proposition ever because I mean, listen, where were you when this boy was coming along and needed your help and needed your intervention and you waited until he got into trouble and now you're happy to drop the hammer, right? I had a judge who I could say that to directly. So I think literally the first line in that letter you have is this client grew up black and poor in Detroit in the 90s at the height of drug crime. And I went headlong into it. And he adopted that argument and really uh, was willing to give my client a no additional penalty sentence in effect. So you do have to know your audience and you, you do have to engage in a variety of ways to get the same outcome. Sometimes you can't do it through a case at all. Some of the most important work I do right now is through a board where we develop policy and try to get resources marshaled together around that policy so that our clients can have access to the kinds of lawyers that they deserve so that in an individual case, they're not going to be crushed by an oppressive prosecutor or sentencing guidelines that are out of whack. And so it's a, it's a very circuitous route to the same outcome, but we got to free our people however we can free our people. So if I got to say it directly, if I got to say it indirectly, if I got to cut you out of the conversation, that's the goal. So that's what I think the takeaway is. Walter, did you I just wanted to tack on a, a question. Uh, yeah, we, we should. We, we'll take some questions. Yeah, I think a Brandy and Jeff covered most of what I wanted to say. The last thing I wanted to say really was, as a young lawyer, whatever your age is, if you're new to the process, Go get help. Mm -hmm. Go ask somebody. You know, ask somebody who can give you the perspective. The reader's perspective, Brandy's perspective, <laughs> Jeff's perspective. Go ask somebody. Yeah, you know, who's done it before. Matter of fact, if you can get a job and learn on somebody else's dime in an office where other people can help you and you can learn from them, do that. But if you come out and, you know, set up your own shop, mm -hmm. hang out your own machine or whatever, go get help. But don't be first chair if you don't know what you're doing in federal court. Mm -hmm. oh, no don't be court. first chair. First, you know, the canons require that we learn. We have to learn 
the particular area of law or we have to refer it to someone who knows. One of the worst things is somebody taking a case and just because they feel that this person has experienced an injustice and they don't know nothing about how to litigate a case in federal court. They don't call it the complex track for nothing. Yeah. It's very complicated and it does take skill, but you can get there. I'm not saying I'm not saying in an elitist way that you can, but I would rather have us not do a trial and error, or I'm going to learn on you. Right. I'm going I'm to I'm learn, spend my time learning how to do a Title VII race hatred case, because that's different from trying to get you a promotion that was snatched. I'm trying to keep a rope away from your neck out of the workplace. That's very different, and that is not the same thing as saying, I want to get your promotion that you should have gotten. Yeah. You know, so that those cases are very complex, and there are lawyers who used to do them who don't do them anymore. We, we really do need to get back to basics in terms of doing race cases because we have no help. Every time I ask someone to associate on one of these hate crimes cases, they'll say to me, Dribu, that's your work. That stuff, those cases are too expensive. I can't afford to do those cases. And they can afford it because they have much more in their coffers than our small broke ass organization, but they're cowards. They want to take easy cases and take the easy way out. And so our people are caught in a sling in, in these workplaces where folks are being beaten up in the workplace by white supervisors. And Shokwe was the one who showed us that at the Frito-Lay plant, where a white supervisor kicked a black woman down to the ground, and he went to the meeting, and they thought that he was going to talk about legal leaves and what, what you needed to do to file your lawsuit. He talked to one group, and that was the black men who allowed that, I'm not going to say cracker because we own the tape, <laughs> allowed, we say Pecklewood anyway, Mississippi, but allowed <laughs> that Pecklewood to that. kick that black woman down to the ground. They stood by and did nothing, and I watched those black men cry when Shokwe got on them and said, how could you stand by and watch? How could you stand by and watch? How can you always know that you can never take a case where people's lives are at stake when they're trying to go to work? How can you just make up your mind and say, I'm not going to take those cases? So I think you do have to stretch out and step out and take some of these matters that nobody wants to take, because we need help with those things. They were cutting new law but we can't do it without a cadre of lawyers who are willing to really do that battle. And there are lawyers in this room who have done that. But, we, but I'm worried about what's coming yeah. in terms of people continuing that legacy. Yeah. Well, that's actually a perfect segue for remarks that John wanted to make. And then I will take some questions. Um, John wants to comment on the legal ticket to soliciting civil rights cases. I'll do it in two minutes. Time it. <laughs> One of the most unsung cases that I teach my students in activist lawyerism, in a CLE, which is designed to provide new activist attorneys with insights on how to address the issues of race in civil and criminal cases. That case is named In Re Edna Primus. It's in your book right here. The facts are simple. A white doctor performed a hysterectomy on a black woman without her consent. The doctors and the bureaucrats believed that too many poor black women were having too many poor black children and were piling up on the uh, social services role. The black female lawyer for the ACLU, in a letter, advised the black woman of her legal rights, her association with this organization that set out to out or identify white doctors performing hysterectomies on black women without their informed consent. The white doctor and his other medical colleagues, the Bar Association and the Crackers in South Carolina brought a bar grievance committee against the black female lawyer with ethical violations. In the old days that uh, Tim would remember, they had ethical violations for maintenance, that is a suit brought for half of another and Champerty, which was a suit for financial outcome, and Baratree, which is the practice of both. And the South Carolina Grievance Committee found the black women lawyer representing the black female who was subject to a hysterectomy without her permission, and of course, 
she couldn't become pregnant after that, and they brought a sanction of a public reprimand. The case went up to the Supreme Court on a well-known precedent called NAACP versus Button. And NAACP versus Button, the United States Supreme Court held that organizations can assemble like we are here today, and the lawyer can ask them, do you want to sue to fight white supremacy and racism? And they say yes. And they pass out a yellow pad. It's a makeshift uh, retainer agreement. And the people sign it, and they go off and file the suit. And the grievance committee says, you're engaged in solicitation wow. of legal cases, which violates the ethics. But the Supreme Court held in Button that an organization and their lawyers have a right to solicit persons and they have a First Amendment right and a 14th Amendment right of assembly of themselves, of expression and protest to white supremacy, and a means of expression is litigation. And in Edna Primus case, the South Carolina lawyer was correct in sending a letter to the woman saying, here are your rights. Do you want to sue? Do you not want to sue? Do you want to be a part of our women's group? They're going to out these white doctors, and that was protected by yes. her First Amendment right. freedom of expression, right. 14th Amendment right to do what was best for black women. That's right. Everybody should take that case around in their hip pocket. Look here in your materials. You will see the holdings on page 16 and on page 18 and the button case on page 11. And that is your ticket to solicit. Lastly, that went up to the Supreme Court on the same day of a case you see in there called a relic. And a relic was a fucking fool. A Philadelphia liar. A relic went up to the hospital where a person was involved in an automobile accident. The person patient was in 10 different degrees of traction. And he said, do you want to sue? By the way, he got a tip from a runner, uh, orderly, in the hospital who he pays money. Tell him when somebody's there in the accident, he runs up there and enters into a retainer person for the passenger. He did nothing on the case, but later went on and he solicited the driver. For those of you who are not in the room and don't realize the conflict, you can't represent the passenger and the driver because the passenger can say either the other car was at fault or the passenger can say the driver in the car I was riding in at fault. And that was a conflict, and the Supreme Court said, no, you can't solicit private cases for money, but you can solicit public interest there cases. And even in those public interest cases, you can seek money damages, sure. and you can get sure. paid by attorney's fees mm -hmm. in the case. Okay. By the way, Charles Hamilton Houston also said, in closing, I'd rather live on my feet than die on, on my knees. knees. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, wow. I noticed, that, uh, I think Lennox was the first person to have his hand up. No, I think I'll defer to um, Fire. Rose. Fire. Rose. Oh, I think Rose had her hand up. Bless Rose Saunders. Uh, yes. My yes. Yes. sister here. Yes, so I, don't, I. I don't want to talk about any age, but we started law together in 1969 as a part of the Reggie program, and she's been a hell raver, an activist lawyer, down there in Alabama with her husband, Senator Hank Sanders, for nearly the last 50 years. Oh, I'm talking to you, my sister. That's so much to say, so let me shorten it. Thank y'all so much. This has been very informative. But I, I have to agree with the spirit of my sister. I don't know the particulars of that particular case, but in general, it is a real problem because most court-appointed attorneys waive the preliminary hearing. And the preliminary hearing is at the stage of the proceedings where you can really, uh, even though the rules of hearsay do not apply, there's a lot you can find out at the stage. And I do believe, uh, I've had cases at my latter part of my life, I've started practicing criminal law, but only people who I think are innocent. And I had a case, <laughs> well, well, I retired and I only came out because the brothers I thought were innocent. And lately I had a case where up to the night before the trial on attempted murder, they kept trying to get him to plead guilty for a misdemeanor. I said, I'll be honest, I said, don't do it. You're not guilty, do not plead guilty to this misdemeanor. And they dropped the case that night before. So my problem is that most of our people don't have good lawyers, mm -hmm. especially court appointed. Right. So when we get involved, we have to set kind of a precedent. 
And so if we just waive the preliminary here for fear of that they might retaliate, number one, that's unethical what they're doing because you have a right to a preliminary hearing. And the second thing is, if you plan to file a civil case, a lot of judges, when you waive the preliminary hearing, it's like acknowledging that there's probable cause for the mm -hmm. arrest. So if you plan to file a civil case, and I think a lot of times we need to file most civil cases, and there are judges that say, well, if you waive the preliminary hearing, you were actually acknowledging that your um, client, that the officer had probable cause of risk. And the second point I um, wanted to make, I, there is this, this dynamic between activist lawyers. Some of us represent activists, and some of us are activist lawyers. Yeah. And we're and, activists while we're lawyers. That's right. That's what I mean. Yeah. And it makes a difference, and it sometimes does interfere with your judgment. Uh, because I've been in situations where I say, oh, I can't get arrested today. It's I got arrested. I got to represent these gotta people. Go to court. So it is a conflict. Uh, and the last point I want to make is that um, this summer, the Eleventh Circuit did pass um, a, a breach of case um, that is strengthening the First Amendment right to activism. As a matter of fact, a charge against me was dismissed this oh, week right. mm -hmm. for protesting. Not that one. Not, not that, that one. one. Oh, okay. I, hope that. <laughs> <laughs> I know which case. You know, you know which case I thought. No, no. Okay. Not, the, right. not the latest arrest. Oh, okay. I, I was arrested for protesting a, uh, one of these Confederate. Confederate monument, and we used that 11th Circuit case to get not just my charge, but all those charges dismissed. And one last point: when Oswald and I were involved in the lawsuit against Tulsa for the um, Wall Street massacre. Mm -hmm. We had a whole debate as to whether or not it should be called a massacre or riot. The activist lawyers wanted it to be called a massacre. But the real lawyers wanted it to be called a riot. Well, they lost the case anyway. And, and, and our men, Oswald, felt that it was an opportunity to educate the public, our people, that it was a massacre. And so to use that language, riot, to us was disingenuous. Yeah. Okay, anybody else? Oh. Um, you, you spoke about a procedure where, I guess, pre-indictment, you write to the prosecutor and try to get the prosecutor to agree to a reduction in the charges. Mm -hmm. Do you find that conversation is different if the prosecutor is black? No, I don't. I mean, so sometimes, sometimes you can't get to them before they charge. I mean, you get the case and it is what it is, and then you're trying to get the charge to come down. I haven't actually. I remember one time I went geared up because there was two people, two lawyers in the case. One sister, um, Sister Brunson, who you know is the hard line, and then uh, and then she had a white co-counsel. And I knew I had to go in ready for battle. I wore my mother Harriet earrings, and we sat and we talked. And I tried and tried and tried to get them to bring their numbers down, and they just wouldn't. I mean, I think sometimes when. Um, when you are of the prosecutorial mind, some, that, that law and order, I, I believe, overrides your ability sometimes to have any empathy for the circumstance. And what I'll get is maybe a deeper acknowledgement, oh, yeah, I understand your client had a hard life, or, or some anger. Listen, your client felt like it was in his best interest to trade away what he owes to his community or his family when he did that. So sometimes I find it's just the opposite. They can be even harsher even in, worse. in uh, right. toe in that line than some of the others. So I, I haven't found it to make all that much of a difference. To be frank. Okay, Lennox. Yeah, Deborah, let me take this opportunity to uh, take advantage of this uh, illustrious uh, group of experts. Um, I, I want to make two observations and want you guys to respond to it. Um, first of all, the role of the community in support of and aiding and assisting in defense or advocating a cause that impacts on that community. And you, as an activist lawyer, how do you interact with the community in order to achieve an objective based upon the contradictions within the courtroom? Okay, whether or not 
you have a judge, if you use the, race, the, the, the issue of racism, the judge is going to go ballistics or whether there ought to be a demonstration outside, and how would that impact jury selection, etc. All of these issues. How do you uh, deal with that question, which ultimately is empowering the community? And understanding as an activist lawyer where the law stops and where power begins in the streets. I mean, that's a political analysis that you have to bring your legal skills to be. Mm -hmm. The second issue I'd like let to take address... Let me take the first one first uh, before I forget it. Well, no, 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 let me deal with the second one while I, before I forget no, it. I got you, first. All right? <laughs> because uh, at this stage of my life, I tend to forget what I'm talking about. Me too. <laughs> the second issue is an issue that I have some strikes on my back. And that is racism from the bench. Mm -hmm. When you see that racism, do you duck and hide? When the judge demeans your client, and you know your client is not going to jail, but under the jail, what is your duty and responsibility? Do you cut and run? Or do you stand up? And if you do stand up, do you understand the implications of Hines versus Middlesex County, which ended up in the Supreme Court? All right? So there's a chilling effect of do you do what you think you ought to do, or do you, in fact, keep quiet? Well, since you did it, were you chilled later on after that when they suspended you for calling the judge a racist? I, I want your observation. <laughs> yeah. and, and we're all going to speak on that, right? Or we were all and asked to speak any, on that. Yeah. Yeah. I I'll thought it was a great turn. rhetorical question that answered itself. I'll take my turn whenever, whenever my turn comes up. Not now. Go. Yeah, I think Jeff I'm addressing it to the chair who can then dispense it. I think Jeff was. Okay, go ahead, Jeff. Go ahead. Well, <clears throat> I think that... Um, as uh, you have to be true to yourself as an African. And when you're the, the, the lawyer in that courtroom and in that dynamic, you really are a mere reflection of your client. You're not separate and apart from the cause, the movement, or the individual who's try they're trying to criminalize. And so, uh, the attack on your client is an attack on you. And so <clears throat> you really can't afford to duck and run. And in fact, being in sessions like this uh, and being uh, associated with freedom fighters and, uh, and warriors, that there are those times when you're confronted with the issue and your knees might buckle. Yes. Mm -hmm. But because of these relationships, we know that we can't buckle, but rather we must stand up. And so uh, I, I, I think we have to understand that it is no difference between our advocacy as the lawyer and the cause and our client. So somebody asked me one time why I do what I do. I said, I do what I do because I want my people to be free and my black ass is not free. Mm -hmm. So as long as we bind up our suffering with our people's suffering, we won't be confused about what to do when faced with the very example that my brother Lennox just told us. We represented some workers in Aberdeen, Mississippi, in Monroe County, one of the most racist Klan counties in the state. And we did not get a verdict. And I'm going to tell you what happened. Every time I objected, and I used the rules of evidence to object, properly object, my objections were always overruled. Tommy Seiler, the white boy lawyer's objections were always sustained. 
So I, right then and there, nine brothers that I was representing, I was representing all nine of them. There was no co-counsel. There was not, we had to get permission to have the paralegal sit at the table with us. I was the lone lawyer. I thought about it for a second. I said, am I going to mess them up more? They're not going to get a verdict anyway in Monroe County, but am I going to mess them up more if I call this judge's attention to the fact that my clients are not going to get a fair shake from you? Mm -hmm. I took a chance. I took a chance. I wanted somebody to take on me. I said, Judge Davidson, may I approach? And of course, both lawyers went up to the bench, and I said, Your Honor, I am concerned about whether my clients can get a fair trial in this courtroom today. Because every time Tommy Seiler objects to anything, he breaks off in the middle of my sentences. He doesn't even let me finish my legal conclusion before he's objecting and you're sustaining. And each time I object, you overrule my objections. He turned red like the color of this. And I said, oh shit, see, you never should have said that. That's your problem, Jerusalem. Always, always opening your mouth. Why could you just not be quiet? So I started chastising myself silently. Where as I saw his reaction, he said, all right, it's on the record. Step back. So I step back, and we go back into the trial. At the end of the day, we didn't get one verdict. The reason we didn't get a verdict is because we took a chance on some brothers who were extremely courageous, and they did the futility argument about these promotions that they didn't get. They said, we saw other black people being denied, so we didn't even apply because we felt like it was futile. Well, in the state of Mississippi, Fifth Circuit, futility doesn't work. In the Second Circuit in New York, futility works, but not in the Fifth Circuit. Guess what? At the end of the trial, the judge stood up on his feet. I never saw anything like this before. He talked to my clients. He said, your lawyer did nothing wrong. She was exceptional in defending you. You just didn't have good cases. And then he turns to me. He says, and Miss Hill, it has been an honor having you in my courtroom. And I was shocked because I thought, and of course he probably still did hate me, but and he was faking it, faking the funk or whatever. But I thought, I don't know what he was going to say, but I'm saying all that to say, Respect. you don't know Respect. what a difference you can make. Two weeks later, they got two black foremen in 45 years. They had never had black foremen at True Temper Sports. In a, in a plant that's 38 to 40 percent African American, they never had black foreman two weeks after the trial that we lost. And there was a flip in terms of quality assurance officers. They became predominantly African American positions that had historically been held by white men. So we, we didn't get the verdict, but in the end, we were able to make a difference because they went all the way. Mm -hmm. Everyone else had dropped it at the EEOC phase, but these nine, we call them the true temper nine, they went all the way, and I have to believe that they went because they went all the way. They got justice from the back end that was brought to the front end. Wow. And I had to say to that judge, I had to say it because what would my clients think? What were my clients thinking of me? I'm sitting there letting him walk all over me in that courtroom, walk all over my clients, I had to say. And I felt like after I did it, I felt, I felt released. I did. I, I knew we weren't going to get justice, but I also knew that we had maintained our dignity. And I think that that is something that's also underrated, not overrated. Amen. To maintain Dignity. There is something to be said about maintaining your personal dignity because how else can you stand if you give up your dignity? And Fannie Lou Hamer, by the way, was also forced uh, into her hysterectomy as well. She, was, she had a hysterectomy against her will. So that's a very, very serious, hurtful issue that we still deal with. And it's a form of genocide. So. Wow. So my answer to the question is absolutely we have to we have to stand up. I mean, who else is going to speak for our people in our voice with our passion? I circulated an article, it was the last piece, um, and it's, it's called The Power of Feudal Speeches, and I encourage you to please read it. Uh, it talks about the story of a brother in our office who um, is a, he is a warrior. And, you know, the, everybody's very familiar with the crack powder cocaine mm -hmm. disparity and how for years and years and years nobody cared and nobody would listen and he would get up and in every case 
make the record anyway and explain that this is ridiculous and it's not solving any crime and it's not it's, it's destroying our communities and so on and so forth. And he kept giving his speech, kept giving his speech, and this, the, the article is written by a prosecutor, so you got to, you know, uh, take that with a grain of salt. But at the end of the day, he was a prosecutor in one of those cases who listened to him. He finally heard him. He was bothered by it. He came out of prosecution and went on to litigate one of the cases that ended up resulting in a reform of that law. And his point was, you got to continue to make the speeches, even if they feel few in that moment. You have to continue to toe that line because we fight. Like they said, that movie, any given Sunday, you fight for the inches, inch by inch. And you have to continue um, to get in that ring and do the work that has to be done. So I don't care if, if I'm talking to the walls. If it'll matter 10 years from now, 20 years from now, yeah, it was worth it. And I want to remember the packet as well. There's an article at the very end of the packet, a paper that I wrote for what used to be called ADLA that's now called American Association for Justice. And it lays out some of the issues around hate violence in the workplace, gives you 21st century examples of the types of issues that people are confronted with in the workplace today. So that's a paper. And we also have another paper online through ATLA called Terror on the Plant Floor, where we talk about the Ingalls case, the Chippewa case, where nooses were made, graffiti was written, uh, Confederate flags on the hard hats, attempted lynchings, and the like in the largest uh, employment place in the state of Mississippi. So that one is called Terror on the Plant Floor, and it's in the Atla papers, and this one is in your uh, materials. Well, it's, we've gone way over, and I really regret it. We couldn't, we could, there's plenty more that we could have said. It's been a really, really excellent, robust discussion, and I really thank the panelists very much. Real quick. Yeah. Uh, we just filed on August 13th a Me Too case in the Mississippi Delta, representing a black woman in the Northern District of Mississippi, Greenville Division, a black woman who worked unfortunately for a black company and for two years was groped, fondled, talked to, suggested to, propositioned, and all, all kinds of disgusting things happened to her. She complained, they did nothing. And when she went to EEOC, two months later, they fired her. So we're alleging sex discrimination and retaliation. And we've gotten some pushback from uh, fake black people, because that's all they are. And they say, oh, you're suing a black company. I said, no, I'm suing some Negroes who allowed <laughs> other Negroes to put their hands on a black woman. That's what I'm doing. I don't know what you're doing. So we have to guard against the, the issue of race traitors. And you mentioned it. A lot of these folks who claim to be black are not really black. And when you go after the enemy, which could be a race traitor, because if you're touching a black woman, if you're touching a black woman, you're touching your sister, your mama, your girlfriend, your wife, your, your high school sweetheart. You're touching somebody who should be held sacred and be respected. And if you're allowing that to happen in your shop that you own, then you're a race trader. You're not an entrepreneur. So I, I think we have to be clear because we've been getting some pushback because the, the employer is a black owner of a black bus company that has ties to great So I'm just saying, we, we feel vindicated every time we talk to her. We know we're doing the right thing. Before, before everyone leaves, I'd just like to acknowledge um, uh, our brother from Africa. He's the president of the African Bar Association. Uh, brother Hannibal Iwefo, who is here with us. Awesome. Welcome. Yeah. Welcome. Yeah. Okay.